Welcome back to Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to the channel for future videos and notifications. In this video, we're going to discuss heroin and morphine's mechanisms of action and also look at their modes of metabolism, which will actually span multiple tissues, the peripheral tissues that is, and the liver. And I think it's fair to do a video like this because in the United States in particular we have an opioid crisis or an opioid epidemic and that's because so many people are addicted to what they call painkillers but those are just opioids. Okay, Now even uh, some famous people, celebrities such as Prince and Michael Jackson fairly recently I suppose you could say died of opioid overdoses or interactions Okay, and these opioids are extremely addictive. Now, opioids, for the most part, are really just structural um, analogs or derivatives of morphine. Okay? Morphine is actually a natural hormone, you could say, or I should say a neurotransmitter that's actually produced in the human brain. There are actually some neurons that actually produce morphine. It was only recently discovered that humans actually have the biosynthetic pathway to generate morphine. We just don't make a large amount of it. Okay, the, the amounts that people take to abuse or, or for painkillers are far in excess of what the brain actually is able to make. Now, here's morphine, and over here we have the chemical structure of heroin. And if you look carefully at these two molecules, they, are, they look almost the same. Um, they both have this heroin uh, tetracyclic, actually pentacyclic, I should say. The only difference is that on these two hydroxyl groups right here, of morphine, you have two acetyl groups. In fact, for that reason, sometimes heroin is called diacetyl morphine because it's just morphine with two acetyl groups. Okay. Now these acetyl groups actually increase the half-life of the molecule because, as we'll see, they actually prevent they prevent the liver from glucuronidating these uh, two hydroxyl groups. Okay, we'll talk about that more in a minute. But in, in essence, they increase the molecule's half-life and prevent it from being degraded, which actually help keep the effects of the opioid in your uh, system a lot longer. Okay, now first let's actually look at the, the mode of degradation, the mode of metabolism of heroin and morphine. So if you were to take heroin, hopefully you don't, but it actually is first converted to monoacetyl morphine. So this acetyl group up at the top that's actually attached to the oxygen of the benzene ring is actually going to get hydrolyzed off. Now, you can have this hydrolyzed off by cholinesterases in the blood. There's also called carboxyl esterases in both the liver and brain. But this is the one reaction that's actually known to be spontaneous, meaning you don't even need an enzyme to do this. This will actually just spontaneously lose its acetyl group up here at the top. And that generates monoacetyl morphine. Now, monoacetyl morphine will also lose eventually its second acetyl group down here, and that will have to be catalyzed actually by enzymes, for example, the cholinesterases in the blood, such as on red blood cells, and carboxylesterases 1 and 2, which are going to be present in the liver and brain, respectively. Okay? And when you lose this second acetyl group, that actually gives you morphine. Now, morphine is going to be able to bind to the mu opioid receptor. That's the primary opioid receptor that morphine acts on. We're going to look at the biosignaling of the opioid receptor, that is the mu opioid receptor, in a couple of slides. Now, we've got this morphine. Now, morphine doesn't have a typical catabolic pathway because from the body's perspective, at least when you take it in this large of an amount, it's uh, perceived by the body more of as a drug, and instead it's uh, conjugated to soluble moieties that facilitate its renal excretion. Now let's talk about this process, which is actually called glucuronidation. And this is actually done for a multitude of metabolites. I'm just going to show it here for morphine. And the enzymes that catalyze these reactions are called UDP glucuronosyl transferases. And if you see the gene encoding it, they're usually UGT and then a number designation, like UGT1, UGT1. GT2, etc. And what these enzymes do is they transfer a glucuronide residue uh, onto whatever molecule you're talking about, for example, morphine. The glucuronide donor is a molecule called UDP glucuronic acid. So this entity over here on the, on the right side, this is uracil, this is a ribose, these are two phosphates, so that's a UDP. And the UDP is actually attached to this sugar residue, that's what glucuronic acid is. So it's UDP glucuronic acid, and typically when the glucuronic acid gets uh, transferred onto another molecule, it's termed a glucuronide residue. 
Okay, so what these enzymes do is they just catalyze the attack, um, usually by a hydroxyl group of some molecule like morphine. So morphine's hydroxyl attacks this carbon right here, and you have loss of a leaving group, so loss of UDP. Okay, so UDP is over here as a product, and then notice this oxygen right here on morphine is now attached to this glucuronide residue, and so because this is the sixth position right here, we would call this morphine six glucuronide. Okay, and this process can also happen on the three position up here. This oxygen is on the three position, and this does not just happen for morphine. This happens for a multitude of many, many, many different uh, xenobiotics, drugs, medicines, etc. when they get to the liver generally. Okay, so here's our morphine. It can act at the mu opioid receptor, which is going to be an anti-pain receptor, an analgesic receptor for the most part. And morphine, though, if it needs to get metabolized, and when it does, this is mostly going to occur in the liver, although there some, are some other tissues, such as the brain, that can do this, seeing as the brain does manufacture some morphine. So different UDP glucuronosyl transferases are actually going to add glucuronide residues onto either the three position up here at the top or the six position down here. Two examples of these would be UDP glucuronosyl transferase 2B7, and we also have the 1A isoform, okay? And these target either one of these hydroxyl groups. If you add the glucuronide residue up here at the top of morphine, it becomes morphine 3 glucuronide. If you target the sixth position down here, as we saw on the, pre on the previous slide we were on, this was morphine 6 glucuronide, okay? And what these glucuronide residues do is, considering they've got all these OH groups, which are polar groups, a carboxyl group, which is actually going to be charged at physiological pH, and so charges help solubilize things, these glucuronide residues, like uh, sulfate groups from the previous video, uh, these glucuronide residues increase the solubility of these molecules, and they help it be excreted by the kidneys. Okay, so morphine, if you were to just take straight morphine, this is what would happen immediately. In fact, what we could say in terms of pharmacology or pharmacokinetics is this molecule morphine actually bypasses phase one metabolism. It does not get metabolized by any P450s. It goes straight to phase two metabolism, and phase two metabolism involves these conjugation reactions. Okay, now again, back to heroin. Heroin has these two acetyl groups on it, which drastically increase its half-life, um, and that keeps the opioid's effects in your system a lot longer so that these glucuronosyl transferases can't, they can't conjugate heroin because the OH, the OH groups, or the oxygens right here, are blocked by these acetyl groups. Okay, and the other thing that's also interesting to note about opioids is you often hear people taking them as a pill. That's really how they're supposed to be taking if it's if it's medicinal. For say you have back surgery, people take opioids for pain. That's also how they get addicted. But when you take the drug orally, when you take morphine or hydrocodone, codeine, etc., those are derivatives. Taking it orally causes the drug to go through the liver pretty quickly, and the liver is the predominant tissue that's going to add these glucuronide residues. So that's actually going to be a mode of administration of morphine that uh, basically gets rid of it more quickly because it goes to the liver more quickly, okay? Because you have to eat it, it gets absorbed through the intestine directly to the liver. So for the most part, for people who abuse these drugs, they'll usually take it uh, intravenously, so they'll inject it. And the reason they do that is because it gets into the bloodstream a lot faster, okay? If you consume it orally, it goes through the digestive tract and then has to get absorbed through the intestine in order to get into the blood. Injecting it straight into the blood is straight into the blood, and also that bypasses the liver. So the liver is not going to be able to metabolize the opioid as quickly because it bypasses it. Additionally, if you've got these sterically blocking acetyl groups, heroin by default is just going to have a longer half-life. Okay? Now let's look at the biosignaling pathway for the mu opioid receptor, and it'll help to explain a little bit of, of morphine's functions. First of all, here is the mu opioid receptor in brown. Um, this is actually going to have a few uh, important regions for binding the molecule of morphine. First of all, the, the, the protein itself has a phenol binding region, and considering we have a benzene ring with an OH, that's a phenol group, so that's going to bind this area. We also have a... a, a 
a tertiary nitrogen binding region. It doesn't say that here, but it is specifically a tertiary nitrogen binding region. Considering this nitrogen has three carbon groups attached, that would certainly qualify as tertiary. And then we have an anionic binding region, and the reason this is anionic is because this OH group down here will often be it can actually lose its proton fairly easily, but it also is going to have a partial negative charge on the oxygen, even if the oxygen is protonated, and so this part is going to bind in the anionic binding region. Okay, So here's the morphine molecule, and here, this is a 7-transmembrane receptor. It's a G-protein coupled receptor. This specifically is the mu opioid receptor, so just to orient you with that. Over here in the middle, we have the enzyme adenylate cyclase. Recall that the natural reaction of adenylate cyclase is to convert ATP into cyclic AMP. And over here, we have a potassium channel, and this potassium channel is normally inhibited by cyclic AMP. And we'll talk about what the implications of that are in a minute. So first of all, we got morphine here. It's going to bind to the mu opioid receptor, which is a G-protein coupled receptor, a GPCR. Now we know G GPCRs have G proteins. Here's the beta and gamma subunits. These are the regulatory subunits that are normally going to inactivate the alpha subunit. Now this alpha subunit is a little bit different than what you may have seen in the past. It's an inhibitory G protein. So when, when morphine binds and activates the opioid receptor, this G alpha, which is inhibitory, is going to dissociate and move over here. Okay, Move over to adenylate cyclase. And it's going to inhibit adenylate cyclase, actually, because it's an inhibitory G-alpha protein. So adenylate cyclase without morphine, so if you get rid of morphine, okay, if you get rid of it, then adenylate cyclase normally is producing cyclic AMP. That's just the baseline. That's what's happening normally without morphine. ATP is being converted to cyclic AMP, and then that cyclic AMP is inhibiting this potassium channel. So this channel is inhibited, so there's no potassium out here. Okay, this potassium is not being uh, moved out into the extracellular fluid. But now you get morphine. Morphine is going to bind to the G protein coupled receptor, the mu opioid receptor. It's going to activate the G protein alpha inhibitory subunit, which will come over here and now inhibit adenylate cyclase. That's going to cause the levels of cyclic AMP to fall, and they're going to go way below baseline. So basically, there's no cyclic AMP anymore. Okay. Now cyclic AMP can no longer inhibit the potassium channel, so the potassium channel by default becomes active, and it's going to move these potassium ions out into the extracellular fluid. By having all these positive charges out here now, you're going to have a bunch of positive charges out here, and that's going to cause membrane hyperpolarization. And oftentimes, you're going to have these mu opioid receptors on nociceptors. Nociceptors are pain receptors. And so remember from your physiology that if you have hyperpolarization of a membrane of a neuron, that leads generally to the inactivation of that neuron and it will stop firing action potentials. And since nociceptors generate pain, Hyperpolarization reduces that pain because the, the membrane uh, of the cell is hyperpolarized and the cell is therefore inactive. So that's part of the reason why morphine is going to be able to reduce pain. It's because it induces membrane hyperpolarization, usually of cells like nociceptors. But there's another effect. We already mentioned that when morphine's present, we have decreased production of cyclic AMP. Now, this ultimately, this process is going to induce changes in gene expression, so this is not as quick, but it's eh, relatively. You're going to have decreased calcium influx due to the decreased cyclic AMP, so there's lower calcium influx. That lowered calcium influx is going to cause decreased neurotransmitter release. Generally, these nociceptors are going to be excitatory in terms of the neurotransmitters they released into the next neuron synapse. So if you have decreased neurotransmitter release, then that nociceptor is not going to be able to transmit pain signals. And so you're going to have decreased pain, which is our analgesic effect. All right. So again, we've got two mechanisms by which morphine does this. It induces membrane hyperpolarization through um, activation of this potassium channel, which is through inhibition of inhibition. Remember, the G protein inactivates adenylate cyclase, which prevents cyclic AMP's inhibition of the potassium channel, leading to this channel's activation and membrane hyperpolarization. 
But also the second mechanism is the cyclic AMP levels go way down, which decreases calcium ion influx, decreases excitatory neurotransmitter release by this neuron, and that leads to the inability to propagate pain signals, so decreased pain and analgesia. All right, so that's how morphine works. And if we were to instead take heroin, which again, I'm not recommending by any means, the heroin's gonna stay in your, sign in your, in your uh, system longer because it has these acetyl groups on it. But in the end, all heroin is, is a prodrug. It is, it is diacetyl morphine, but it's a morphine derivative with a longer half-life that is not able to be glucuronidated by uh, the liver because these oxygens are blocked by these acetyl groups. Okay. Thank you for watching this video, and I hope it gave you some good information about heroin and morphine metabolism and their mechanisms. Um, please make sure to like this video and subscribe to the channel for future videos and notifications. I plan on doing some other videos about drug mechanisms in, in, at some point. Thank you for watching and see you next time.